The Plateau Rayleigh Instability by Garrett Stubbings. So what is the Plateau Rayleigh Instability? It is how a cylindrical jet of water basically becomes unstable at a point and turns into these uh, discrete spherical drops. So in this uh, in this video I'm gonna go over an analytic look at uh, the stability of the cylinder and how we get away from it essentially. So how do we get to this analytic solution? We assume that it's a high Reynolds number in viscid flow and that body forces are negligible in our, uh, in our look at the radius of the jet. So in looking at that radius we're assuming that it is just a perturbation around the, uh, the base radius which is whatever radius the flow comes out of our tap or whatever with and it has some perturbation so it has Essentially, we're assuming that there's going to end up with some real positive instability term and that it's going to come out of uh, essentially this sinusoidal perturbation of our flow. So it's not going to be a perfectly uniform cylinder and that there's going to be some interaction between these two leading to an instability. So the actual solution goes much like we've seen in this course, which is you go into your cylindrical coordinates and you have a look at your UR and UZ, and you basically just tack on your uh, perturbation to those two components, and then you're also looking at pressure, which has the perturbation as well. So they all have these big R, big Z, big P, and then the perturbation, and they're all radially dependent exclusively. So then you can go into your Navier-Stokes equations down here and solve for our, the R and Z components, and essentially you only have the acceleration of those components equal to the uh, negative pressure gradient over the density. You're throwing away the spatial component of your convective derivative, the body forces, and the viscous forces. And then you plug in your solutions from, uh, or I guess, yeah, your proposed solutions above into these equations, and you end up with these uh, two relations between the capital R, Z, and P. And importantly, between since both R and Z are related to P, you can relate big R, big Z to big R by taking the derivative of this second equation and throwing it in here which gives you this relationship here, which is going to be helpful uh, later when we're solving for R. So we've used Navier-Stokes, now we use the other equation, which is uh, con the continuity equation, conservation of mass, and we're in radial, what is it called, cylindrical coordinates. So you have, uh, unfortunately, the product rule for the radio component. Yes. And then you can plug in your proposed solution equal to zero, classic, and then you take the derivative with respect to R because we need to get rid of this Z. And the way to do that is taking the, deriv the re derivative with respect to R. So yeah, you end up with this di Z di R term in the back, another ugly product rule and then you eliminate the di z di r with this relationship and you multiply by r squared and you end up with this here ODE which should look familiar it's the Bessel ODE with solutions which are modified functions of the first and second kind so it's c times i1 of kr small r plus d I think it's big K one but this one diverges at zero yes yeah, so it's only the only the modified Bessel function of the first kind that's going to be applicable because yeah the second kind diverges at zero so anyways you continue with your solution where big R is this this Bessel function so what you do then is you look at your boundary conditions 
which is just the balance between, uh, well, first of all, you have the velocity of this boundary, which is just given by your perturbed velocity in the radial direction. And importantly, you're balancing the forces between your, uh, your surface tension and your total pressure. So your total pressure, you have like P-naught plus your perturbed pressure. And then this, uh, this surface tension term, which uh, you just use the, uh, the curvature to relate those two. Oops. Equals one over R1. One over R1 plus one over R2, which are the, uh, the radii of curvature in the Z direction is uh, this curvature and then in this uh, if you want to define the azimuthal direction also has a radius of curvature so this z direction you end up with this uh, this k dependence which is your wave number of your perturbation which is determining how curvy this bit is and then the other part is just um, the radius of your cylinder essentially so this the curvature of your um, this dependent on the wave number gives you this kr squared and then you have a one out front from your radial component of the curvature and that basically gives you you can relate that through uh, a little bit of algebra to the solution of the real part of your um, your exponent in your uh, in your radius growth and you see that for k times r naught, which is your uh, your base radius, that if k times r naught is less than 1, and I should mention greater than 0, then you have a positive real coefficient in the exponent in front of your t term, so you have a exponentially growing um, radius, so your, your cylinder is unstable. So there you go, you end up with an unstable cylinder, which is no good if you want to keep it a cylinder, but it's pretty cool that you can find an analytic solution to this, uh, well, at least some aspect of this problem. So, filming this turned out to be a, a bit of a hassle, because essentially, since um, your exponential growth is dependent on radius, you have to have a really small... Uh, you have to have a really small jet or stream or whatever. So I broke a pen and then shot some water out of it. And then you have this cylindrical area here. <laughs> and then you have uh, your individual droplets later. And how I did it was I just uh, squeezed some water out of this Ziploc bag with my pressure applying device and my angling device into my sink. Which, okay. So I uh, took the assumptions verbatim and assumed that it didn't matter which way I orient my, uh, my apparatus. So if I go straight up directly opposing gravity, which of course doesn't matter according to the assumptions, then we should still see a cylindrical section, and a, uh, a deviation from the cylindrical section in these discrete drops, which is what we see. It does look a little wonky in this way though, but it does help with dealing with the um, trying to film a very fast moving stream of water which was somewhat successful so I did try to get closer to vertical completely vertical was uh, just just not doable frankly with the uh, with my <laughs> apparatus so I went uh, at least partially horizontal here to hopefully get a, a clear view and with this one I tried to try to identify the individual droplets instead of just seeing some uh, some noisy things like you saw at the start of the video which means trying to move my camera at the same speed as the droplets of water which is partially successful sometimes <laughs> but you do see the characteristic cylindrical bit and then later down the line these individual droplets which hopefully hopefully you have seen but yeah so this is this is the plato rayleigh instability in uh 
in action. Now I will add the disclaimer that I'm a filthy theorist, so uh, yeah, don't hate my experiment. I should also note that I uh, I owe MIT OpenCourseWare for the derivation, which I can provide you with uh, upon your request. Thank you very much. This has been my uh, my video on the Plato-Rayleigh instability.